a source of, uh, what do you call it, uh, anxiety and disturbance. Okay. Let me just ask a question then. Uh, why is it that the Bhagavatam, it, it, it's, it's kind of looking at the world, it seems from the perspective of a male, look, looking at the world, and, and showing Maya from that point of view, or not the reverse, from the female point of view? You know, for example, like, uh, you know, uh, in the teachings of the family to like the children to jackals and all that kind of thing and the wife to like the tigers. So why 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 is the Bible Times looking at it from the perspective of like male? I, I don't think it's a question of male or female, I think it's a question of uh, what he's pointing out is that when consciousness is separated from Krishna, uh, in other words when, when we're living in the material lusty affairs of this life, you know, of the material world then all of these things are uh, hostile. Everything is hostile to our self-interest. Our self-interest is to go back to home, back to God. So Kapila is showing how the dangers of the material world, the negative, if you like, because Sankhya, uh, Sankhya means to count. So it's, it's, to, it's to measure or count or to analyze the adverse uh, adversities of the material world. Now, when you talk about the jackals and all of these things, these are uh, examples of material energy working upon us in various forms. The same thing can be understood that when um, a situation or a, a relationship or whatever is doped out in Krishna service, then of course these examples are not appropriate. They're not appropriate examples in the true sense. Because we see that many of Lord Chaitanya's followers were married, but it wasn't uh, condemned by Lord Chaitanya. He himself is a householder, but it's not the householder uh, situation or the, or the children or wife. Uh, it's the question that if Krishna is removed from that, if you remove Krishna, then all of those philosophical points come into being. Just like the same thing, if we don't offer our food, we're eating poison. So you could say in the material world, everyone's eating poison. So then someone can say, well, you Hare Krishnas are eating poison. But we're not, we're eating prasadam because it has connection with Krishna. The connection with Krishna is the most important thing. And when there's that connection, then Krishna says that I give protection. Their devotees are under my protection. So one is protected by Krishna. Just like Bhakti Thakur had so many children. But he never forgot about Krishna ever. So the point is, is that to show an example to us about how it is not, it is not the, uh, the external that's the problem, it's the internal. If, the in, if you're internally not Krishna conscious, then all of these external things are great dangers, great adversities, great hostilities there. But if you are Krishna conscious, then you can have, just like we see many examples, uh, Kadarga Muni. Look at Kadarga Muni, who was flying off in a big spaceship and was enjoying it. He expanded himself nine times to have more uh, sexual activity than ever. But he never forgot Krishna. So it's not a question of uh, the uh, external, it's a question of the internal. What is the internal? See? The internal situation. So you can't uh, analyze without understanding the full picture. Uh, if you say, Carl Blank, that all women are evil, then we might go around having witch hunts and killing them and chopping them up. That's not our philosophy. That's negative because neg the neg that's negation again. The negative is based upon a uh, wrong idea. You cannot renounce sex life. It's not possible. Nobody can renounce sex life. You can only love Krishna. Then sex life becomes insignificant. But if you try to renounce sex life, then it's very, very, very difficult. Uh, to do. And even if you renounce, Krishna is the source of power of renunciation, so therefore you're still getting that power of renunciation from Krishna. And just like Arani Kashitu, when you wanted power, you have to get it from Brahma. You always have to get it from someone. It's not something you have, it's something that you have to get from someone. So if you become the devotee of Krishna, Krishna says, I protect my devotees. He says, surrender unto me, I will give you all protection. So even if you have a hundred million wives, you will have no problem. 
the progenitors of the universe. They had so many wives. They had no problem. One time we were asking Prabhupada about demigods. Prabhupada said, demigods are, are devotees. And the difference between heavenly planets and the material is there you can have sense gratification, but you don't forget Krishna. Here you have sense gratification, you immediately forget Krishna. So it's a question of power. You see? It's not the problem of a sense gratification, it's the problem of remembering Krishna. So therefore, that's why these stories in the Bhagavatam, sometimes they're very bewildering, because there's obviously sense gratification going on. But there's not forgetfulness of Krishna, otherwise why would they be recorded as remembrances of Krishna? Because they're transcendental. So that, like a chintya beta or beta tattva aspect, is that simultaneously the energy is not different from the energetic, but in all cases the energy is controlled by the energetic. So if we surrender to the energetic, then the energy cannot do anything to us that the energetic doesn't want. So we will not be uh, worried about these uh, situations. But if we are not surrendered to Krishna, then everything is hostile. Even if you, are, uh, you don't have a, a wife or children or anything else, you could be completely bogus. But you may, you may, because you have no love for Krishna. So you may be the biggest renouncer in the world, but you have no, your spiritual life is zero. Because you don't have Krishna. So it's, it's not a question of simply, uh, uh, in other words, it's not a question, you see, bhakti is not dependent on vairagya or karma. She's not dependent on jnana or vairagya or karma. Uh, jnana and vairagya, sorry. They are her assistants. You see, bhakti is, is a power in itself. It doesn't rely on anything. That's why some of these stories are amazing. Because you can see that there's no, they're just uh, the pure, pure spiritual uh, thing going on. But, because bhakti is not dependent on anything, she's independent. And that doesn't mean we do all nonsense and say, oh, that, that was bhakti. But it's true, obviously, philosophically, all of these things are absolutely true. So, it's a question of understanding. If you take one side without the other. In other words, if you take the philosophy that women are all evil and children are all uh, jackals and, and they're all tigresses and this and the other. And, but you don't take the other side, which is to become devoted, then it's, it's, um, there's nothing. It's not the idea. It's the dangers of that situation, the danger, the danger of household and life. But for a devotee, that danger, if it's properly situated, should not be there. I just wonder why it's written from that perspective. So. Because that, because it's like... Because you, know, you, you could say, for example, it, it, it could say, um, you know, uh, be careful of your husband because he's like, uh, you know, he'll be beat you or something like that. But, well, so, why it, so why does it say, you know, it's always like addressing to the, to the female heart dangers? It's not only, I mean, at the end of it, there's a whole section where it goes up about the, the male section, and then it says exactly, and of course, it's exactly the male is the same, you know, it says it yeah. like itself. And Prabhupada says it in several purposes at that time as well. Yeah, so. I, I, I'm aware of that, but I'm just wondering why the whole, is there some kind of... Like well, the thing is, you see, the whole material energy is based on sex life. The whole interaction of, of matter in the material world is the interaction between male and female. So obviously, the Bhagavatam is dealing with this analytical study of interaction between male and female. So the dangers of that are analyzed. What are the dangers? So examples are used so as to make one aware of the dangers of falling into the pit, into the dark well of the material world. And, you know, there's just as much danger for a woman with a man as there is for a man with a woman because it's all interaction of, of, of man and female energy. Isn't it also considered that a, a male body is more suitable for self-realization and uh, a woman should follow a man who self-realized and that way she can also... Continue. Yeah, but that wasn't his point. His point is about why it seems right. to be always slanting on female. Uh, the, 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 in other words, if there's a certain degree of condemnation his point is that the women seem to be getting the worst end of the stick. But, you know, as far as the woman following the man, yes, that's, that's, uh, 
Vedically, see, Vedically, Vedic civilization, the men were Krishna conscious, the women were Krishna conscious, and the ideal, the idealism of it is that they would both go back to home, back to God. But obviously, a woman's body is more emotional towards, uh, more attached towards material things. It's just the way they constitute. Now, that's not for a devotee, because a woman devotee may be much more advanced than a man devotee. Because ultimately, see in bhakti, why is bhakti the only system that allows marriage? None of the other yoga systems allow it. If you go back and study yoga, you'll find all the other systems don't allow marriage. Only bhakti. Because bhakti is beyond all other considerations, you understand? It's, 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 not, a, it's not a system. It's the end all and be all of knowledge. So therefore, if one is situated in bhakti, then these things are not actually... Uh, as relevant. They're generally relevant if one doesn't have bhakti. So if a woman has love for Krishna, then she's much greater devotee than a man who might be a big renunciate, big educated, big learned. That's why Lord Chaitanya worshipped gopis. They're women. Why did he not work, worship Vasudeva, uh, uh, the compiler of Bhagavatam, or Sugadeva Goswami? He worshipped gopis. Because gopis' hearts are full of love for Krishna. So actually, we're all female. In reality, in spiritual sense, every one of us is a female because we're feminine energy, not masculine. Masculine is an artificial creation of material association. We are all feminine. So therefore, we have to become females to love Krishna if you want to enter into, uh, you know, the deeper philosophical aspect. So what is the nature of a female? She has a softer, delicate. Female means delicate. So we have to delicately love Krishna. So the gopis were worshipped by Lord Chaitanya. He was a big male renunciate. Lord Chaitanya, there's no one more renounced than Lord Chaitanya and his followers. They were all great renunciates, but they were all worshipping gopis. And what were the gopis doing? The gopis were offering their bodies in the service of Krishna. So one could say, well, that's a bit weird, isn't it? Big male renunciates worshipping females who are uh, offering their bodies to a male. So therefore you could say, it was all of this is funny philosophy. But the point is you have to understand is that we are neither male nor female. We are actually eternal servants of Krishna. So in the spiritual world, we are Prakriti and Krishna is Purusha. And Radharani is the supreme personality of uh, servitude and we are all her servants. So we naturally love Radharani uh, so as to be engaged in her service to give our bodies to Krishna. So ultimately, you know, it's all a little complicated, isn't it? <laughs> okay, Shiva Bhagavatam Mahaprabhu Ki Jai.